Bolche Rove a Carja, Tommy Don Shock on Law on Starul, Scale the Heron, a Comor August a Crivenu, down up in a full at Nedic Fair. Today uh, we're going to look at um, the probably the bloodiest day of the bloodiest month in the Black and Tan War, the War of Independence, Bloody Sunday, the 21st of November 1920. And uh, there were a, a series of events that happened uh, on that day, which were to prove uh, pivotal in the struggle for independence. It began with the uh, execution of 14 British agents by uh, the Irish Republican Army. Uh, the, the, it followed in the afternoon of that day uh, with the murder of 14 civilians by uh, the uh, Crown Forces in Crow Park uh, on the afternoon of, of Bloody Sunday. And then that evening, that night, uh, three Republicans were killed in Dublin Castle by Crown Forces, uh, all in within the space of uh, 24 hours. And uh, here to discuss those events and remember them, uh, we have three guests. We have uh, Chris Clancy Wilson, who is a relative of Padder Clancy, who was one of the three Republicans who were killed in Dublin Castle uh, on that night. We have uh, Liz Gillis, a uh, very distinguished historian, who uh, is uh, specialising in that uh, period of history and is the author of several books, as is uh, our other historian guest, Larkin Collins, uh, who has also uh, been a, a prolific author and a, a founder of the 1916 walking tour in Dublin and very familiar with these events. So we're going to start off uh, looking at the events of that morning, the uh, morning of the 21st of November, uh, 1920. And I'll ask you, Liz, uh, it was, I think, in a way, a culmination of an intelligence battle between uh, the IRA and uh, the British administration in Dublin Castle. So can you tell us about that and how that came about? Yeah, um, it was inevitable that something like this was going to happen. It was just who was going to strike first. And it turned out that it was Collins. Um, the IRA had basically just destroyed the, the um, British intelligence, the G Division, um, from 1919 right through to 1920. And the British were caught off guard. But things began to change in May 1920 with the climate of almond winter, also known as the Holy Terror. And with a name like that, you can imagine that he wasn't a, a very nice person, but seemed to be well up for the job. Um, it was difficult to get uh, recruits into the intelligence division. And what he did was he brought in his own and um, brought them from overseas, fellows who had served in Russia, in Egypt and so on. And rather than operating within the, the police uh, stations and Dublin Castle and so on, these fellows were living in the city. They were living in houses all around Dublin City, concentrated primarily on the south side. Um, and they began to have successes against Collins and his intelligence unit. Um, the military were carrying out lots and lots of raids. Um, and this really culminates in September, from late September on, you see a real concentration of the raid, and you were picking up a lot of um, IRA men, and that continued right through. Then we came to, or come to October, and the IRA did suffer some losses, a uh, big loss being John Tracy was killed in Talbot Street, um, outside the Republican Outfitters. You had the death of Terence Sweeney on hunger strike in November, then you had the execution of Kevin Barry in Mount Joy Jail. But one of the things that really um, sort of cements in Collins's head that something has to be done, uh, well, two things actually. On the 9th of November, Lloyd George made a, a speech at the Lord Mayor's Banquet in London where he said, um, basically, we have more divided the throats through our actions. Um, but also you had three of Collins's key men, key intelligence men, picked up by the Crown Forces. Um, it was Thornton and Tobin and I think Cullen maybe. And that was a real, real close call for Collins. Now they were released, but the British realised who they had released. So it was only a matter of time. So it was literally, someone was going to strike. 
Collins decided it was going to be him. And they've been planning something like this for a couple of months. We're getting towns from everywhere. I mean, everywhere. RAC men, DMP men, G men, members coming them on. And um, they even got some IRA men to walk in the houses that these um, agents were living in. Um, the housemates were passing on information. And uh, they had it all. They drew up a list. Um, there were 50, 55 names maybe on the original list. It was given to Cal Brewer as the uh, Minister for Defence for the final sanction. He had at least 15 names taken off the list because there wasn't enough evidence um, to prove that these men were intelligence officers or court martialed officers. And um, so there were 25 targets on the day. And it was decided 21st of November, 9 o'clock. That would be the time for all of these operations to take place and it would be over in minutes and hopefully take out the British intelligence uh, network. So the the um, as you say, and I think it's something that's maybe overlooked. Uh, Armand Winter and his uh, units, they were having some success uh, against the IRA, and I think I'm right in saying the arrest, particularly of Dick McKee, who was OC of the Dublin Brigade, and Patter Clancy, who was the vice OC, uh, that was in train before the executions of the spies. I think. Um, I, I think they, they they were certainly on their trail. Um, that was probably going to happen anyway. Um, and of course, it led on then after the events of the day that they were killed in the castle. But I think they had been tracked down. Wouldn't that be correct? Well, uh, yeah. And the thing with McKean Clancy is were known to the authorities because both had been in prison and especially with Clancy because he had had the hunger strike in April 1920. He was a real, um, you know, torn aside. Um, of the, 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 uh, the establishment. Um, and the, the tragic thing about McKee and Clancy is that they had been involved the night prior to Bloody Sunday with Collins Ward came through that it was a raid. Um, they made their way to Gloucester Street, now Sean McDermott Street, to the house of Sean Patrick, but they'd been followed by um, a, 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 an informer. And he got through to Dublin Castle and the raiding party arrived. But what is so important about the, the, the minutes before they were actually arrested is that McKee had the list of all the targets the next morning um, and he destroyed that literally before the raiding party entered the premises. Um, so I think if that had been found, God knows what would have happened immediately. Maybe we had the same outcome, but it probably would have happened before, you know, um, the, 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 the way they were killed or when they were killed. Um, but it was certainly a huge cue for uh, for the authorities to have in their their, their grasp, McKee and Clancy. Yeah, that's very interesting because I think that is often overlooked. Um, the, the the how closely those two events were were linked, um, and I I think I read in um, in uh, the four glorious years that uh, a lot of what, when when the executions happened in the days that followed. There was an exodus, or whatever you call it, an influx of uh, agents and others into Dublin Castle to the safety of the castle because they realised that uh, the game was probably up. Uh, they were known where they were living and so on. Um, is that is that correct? And what happened to afterwards to Ormond Winter and his uh, because they were known as the Cairo gang, isn't that correct? Uh, and his network of agents. Yeah, so you have that immediate reaction because this was totally out of the blue, totally unexpected that they could be hit like this. You know, it was unexpected that they could hit the enemy, but the enemy couldn't hit them. Um, and you do have that immediate influx, panic setting in and just getting to the safety of Dublin Castle. Um, what Ormond Winter, in, in terms of the, this, this operation not destroying the British intelligence because it didn't actually destroy because there were some targets that, that weren't at their location that morning. Um, but it really, really struck them to the core. So you have them being brought back in Southern Castle, but then what they did was they decided that don't have them living in, you know, around the city, keep them in one place. So they put them in a hotel just down off Dame Street, which totally played into the hands of Collins because he knew where to wear it one spot. So they used to just attack them going into the hotel. There was a military guard on the hotel. But they were like sitting ducks. It didn't protect them in any way because they were still um, able, Collins was still able to get to them. 
Um, in terms of Home and Winter, um, you have uh, him getting more people into his, his, his system, um, but also the, the IGO gang. They really come into prominence around this time, and that was um, the, the group led by Eugene Igo, who was an RAC uh, officer from um, Mayo or the West somewhere, um, and they were very, very successful um, in, in targeting the IRA and getting IRA lads to see what they were doing was they were using the local RIC men from around the country because a lot of fellas had to get out of the counties and came up to Dublin. So they'd have them watching them at the train stations and they'd alert Dublin that this chap is on the train, he's heading up to Dublin, they'd be waiting at the train station Dublin and Broadstone. And in some cases, I think when Char the case of a chap called Newless, um, Charlie Donald talks about in his witness statement where he got on a merciful item um, off of uh, Igo and his gang and the, the squad and the intelligence officers tried to get them but they couldn't so they were like the equivalent of the squad because they were in plain clothes and um, they were operating as the squad were um, so that was the, the next phase of it um, after Bloody Sunday. Yeah, you, you refer to the squad, and for maybe for those who wouldn't be familiar, uh, wasn't the squad essentially a, the counterintelligence unit managed by Michael Collins and consisting of members of the, the Dublin Brigade and others? Um, isn't that true to say? Well, you, you had the squad and then the actual intelligence officers. Um, so the intelligence officers weren't meant to actually um, carry out the assassinations, but they were to go on the operations. Um, so basically they would pass on, gather the information, identify the potential targets. And then if it, it, it hit, so for example, on the morning of Woody Sunday, Charlie Dalton went to um, Pembroke Street, 28 Pembroke Street with Paddy Flanagan and the Ford Italian um, men. And his role there was to gather up um, the documents that the intelligence officers and um, the British intelligence officers had on them while the um, members of the Southern Brigade and the squad um, took part in the actual assassinations. And one thing I'd really like to say, Michal, about this operation, it was huge. The amount of people that were involved in this is it's massive. Like you're talking about 140, 140 people, probably a few more, because it's not just the intelligence officer with members of the squad, with members of the Dublin Brigade, there was coming a man brought in, there were the scouts outside, there were the getaway drivers. It was massive, a huge operation. So at the next event, a uh, catastrophic event really on uh, that day, was the arrival of the Crown Forces at Crow Park uh, and the, uh, the murder of 14 civilians there. Um, I have a personal connection with this myself because my grandfather was actually there. He was an eight-year-old boy and he often told me that his father uh, dropped him from a high wall into the arms of men below who were, who were actually saving the children from the gunfire. So that made a big impression on me, naturally. But obviously there'd be, there'd be many, many people around Dublin and around the country who had uh, relatives there on that day because there was a large crowd. It was a Dublin Tipperary uh, challenge match. So I'm going to ask uh, Larkin Collins to tell us about that uh, event. Well, Michal, uh, that's very interesting that you say that about your uh, grandfather because um, just to explain to people, Croke Park obviously was nothing like the grand stadium it is today. It would nearly be fair to call it a, a field that was surrounded by walls and iron fences just off Jones's Road. Um, there was a very high wall to the, to the right-hand side, you might say, that dropped down into Belvedere uh, uh, football grounds, you know, our rugby grounds there, Belvedere school grounds, a 20 foot wall. So that story has uh, a, a little bit of credence, you know. But um, uh, Croke Park, of course, is named after uh, the patron, the first patron of uh, the GAA, the Gaelic Athletic Association. 
uh, Archbishop uh, Croak, uh, Thomas Croak, a man who uh, it was said was at the barricades in Paris in 1848 because he was studying over there, and a man who was also the um, bishop in Auckland in New Zealand. So he was well traveled, but he was also a very staunch uh, nationalist. He was associated with the Land League and he was the chairman of. Um, the Irish Parliamentary Party, the Home Rule Party. So he's a, a, a very good choice to lead the GAA, as they had a slightly nationalist bent anyway. Um, it's not fair, though, to say that everybody who was involved in the GAA was also involved in the IRA, but it was quite clear that there was often cross-membership as well. But this made perfect sense because the IRA were set up along parish lines. You know, you would you would uh, you would be a company, and it would be named after the local parish. But the GAA, as everybody knows, is also set up along parish lines. So, if there was a young man in his twenties who was good and strong, he'd be used in the football team, and he might also be encouraged to join uh, the Irish Volunteers. So, the British Army and the auxiliaries and the Black and Tans and the RIC policemen were all going to go up to Croke Park and the British Army would um, be used as crowd control and the police would search everybody. Now, first of all, that was a very poor decision because uh, how are you going to search thousands of people in a football stadium without causing absolute mayhem? And people were on tenter hooks anyway, because as soon as rumours went around about the actions that the IRA had carried out that morning, you can understand that there was a certain fear in the air. In fact, a few members, a few high-ranking officers within the IRA came up to uh, Luke, um, Luke O'Toole, uh, the, the, the secretary for the GAA, and they encouraged him to try and cancel the match. But he, he said himself, everybody was there already and people would have still come up to the grounds and they would have hung around Jones's Road. So if there was any sort of attempted action by the British, there was no point in cancelling the match at that stage. It was too late. And when it kicked off, uh, it was due to kick off at 2.45. Um, a plane, an airplane from Collins Aerodrome, which was used by the British Army, and uh, it flew low over Croke Park and circled a couple of times. And then it fired a flare up into the air. And not long after that, uh, the British Army arrived first, and then truckloads of tans and auxiliaries, police essentially, came screeching to a halt outside the grounds. And obviously people ran uh, for their lives. And uh, the, the auxiliaries and tans burst into Croke Park and started firing wildly and indiscriminately into the crowds. And uh, of course, pe you know, people ran, uh, but uh, 14 people lost their lives as a result. There was one woman, uh, Jane Boyle is her name. She was 26 years of age. She was with her fiance and um, uh, she lost her life. She was actually due to get married the following Friday and she was buried in her, uh, in her wedding dress. Some of them were, were very young as well. Um, uh, children were also involved. Uh, there's William Robinson, who was only 11 years of age. Perry was his nickname. He was shot in a tree. And two men, Tom Doyle and John Bourne, put him into a cab and uh, sent him off to a uh, hospital. But he died a couple of days later. Another lad um, who was 10 years of age, Jerome O'Leary is his name. He was from Blessington Street. And he was shot in the head at the canal end. And 14-year-old lad called Billy Scott got a chest wound so bad that people thought um, uh, he had been bayoneted, you know. There are other cases of, of men who were in their 50s on the same wall that your grandfather uh, was dropped down from. One of those lads, uh, I think he was 57 years of age, he was, um, uh, he was after helping another man up onto the wall and then he was shot himself. Um, so yeah, it was a day of absolute terror. People ran to the dressing rooms and they were squashed in there like sardines. And then a few tans came in there and started firing into the air. You can only imagine how, how fearful and scary it was. But the worst thing I think 
was that crowds ran for the exit and um, there was a British, well, there were two British armoured cars outside and one of them fired the machine gun into the air. Now, when you're being fired at from a machine gun, it doesn't matter whether it's aiming for you or whether it's going into the air because your brain is naturally going to think you're being fired at. So the crowd turned and a, a terrible crush ensued. And uh, James uh, Tehan, who was a publican, he was a Tipperary man, but he was a publican in Dublin. He had a pub on Green Street. He was crushed to death in the uh, in the um, in the crowd, you know. Yeah, and uh, there was an attempt, of course, afterwards by uh, the British to claim that they had been fired on first, a bit like Bloody Sunday in Derry later on in '72. Uh, but there's no basis for that. Um, I mean, looking at it. Uh, you know, it, it, it fits into the pattern very much of reprisals uh, around the country. Now, obviously not on the same scale, but I mean, there was a pattern very clearly emerged at that stage, wasn't there, where uh, any action at all by the IRA against the Crown Forces was met with reprisals against civilians. Yeah, very, very much so. And, you know, it's no surprise that uh, men who are trained to murder will murder. And it's the same, as you said, rightfully, in Derry in uh, 1972, when uh, the report, uh, the first report, which was a whitewash, the Widgery report, which uh, refused to acknowledge um, uh, any of the witness statements. Widgery himself didn't read the witness statements. Uh, he ignored um, testimony from the wounded as well, as you know. But um, the same in December 1920, there was a, 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 an inquiry held, but it was in camera. So um, the, it wasn't released until around about 2003 before they released it. And um, they basically blamed the people who were in Croke Park. They said that they fired first, the same way as the Widgery report in 72 blamed the march organizers. It was their fault for organizing a march in uh, such a situation. So yes, this is why history, I always say, Michal, is so important because it's important to understand what happens in the past may happen in the future again. And it's important to be armed for such situations, if you follow me. Yeah, exactly. And I was reading recently um, uh, uh, about the, the Amritsar massacre by the British Army in, in India. And, uh, it, you know, the, the attitudes, not so much of the, 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 the rank and file who did the shooting, but of the higher ups who really regarded the, the people of India and in, in Ireland's case, the people of, of Ireland and Dublin as, you know, lower, lower caste, if you want. And really, they didn't count that, that much. And, uh, you know, hence there was cover ups and so on. And in fact, I think uh, I've seen headlines from the time which described the Crow Park massacre as another Amritsar. Yeah. So there was a consciousness there of the yeah. parallel, you know, obviously on scale, the, the Amritsar massacre was much greater, but proportionately for the size of the population of, of uh, Ireland and the population of India, you know, they were very comparable. Yeah. Um, so thanks for that, uh, Lorcan. No. The, the, um, the, the third uh, tragedy then of that day uh, and night uh, was the was the event in in Dublin Castle, uh, as we mentioned earlier. Dick McKee was the OC of the Dublin Brigade. Uh, Patter Clancy was the vice OC. They were both very active uh, in the IRA in Dublin, and they were arrested. And also arrested was Connor Clune, uh, who was uh, a young man from County Clare who had come to Dublin. Uh, he was a Republican, but he was in no way uh, near as active as Dick McKee and uh, Patter Clancy. Um, they, they were taken to Dublin Castle to uh, the DMP headquarters there, which was the, had been the G division that, that uh, Liz mentioned. So we're, we're very uh, privileged to have with us a relative of Patter Clancy, Chris Clancy Wilson. And uh, we're going to ask uh, Chris to say a few words about those, that event and, and her own relative. Great grandniece of Patrick Clancy. My grandfather, Patrick Clancy, was his nephew. And obviously, 
told us all about Padder and Connor and Dick and what happened from the family's point of view, what they were able to find out. So, um, and it's in, in the history books anyway, but um, Padder and Dick were arrested. Liz was right when she said earlier that Dick had some names of who was to be that morning, who was in the raid that morning. But Padder had the list of names of those that weren't, uh, the names that were taken off. So both were actually caught burning names at the time. And uh, so they were taken with, with Connor to um, Dublin Castle to the guardroom and they were interrogated for hours. Even after nine o'clock, it went on. Like, we we're told that they were arrested at about 2 a.m. It was really early in the morning that they were lifted. And um, they were taken to the guardroom and it was Captain Hardy and Brigadier General Ormond Winter and Captain King were the three who were doing the interrogations. Now, there is like a, a fake picture, uh, which we've always believed that it's a setup where there's the three lads are sitting on a bed surrounded by a couple of soldiers. You might be familiar with it, but it's, it's a posed photo. We don't believe it is them. We believe it's three people in their clothes. Um, so uh, what the British Army revealed as to what happened was that Padder somehow managed to get behind a mattress and while behind this mattress jumped up with a shovel and a grenade and attempted to attack the three gentlemen that I just named. And while he was doing that, Dick attempted to shoot them. And this didn't phase Connor at all. He just sat there and let it all go on. And that's why the three of them were shot. And that was a story that was printed in the Independent the next morning. And which is ironic because Padder had pulled a party independent printing offices earlier in the year. He took part of machinery in that again. But what actually happened, the bodies were finally released and were released to two Capuchin brothers. And I can't get their names just now. It was two Capuchin brothers and they buried Thomas McSweeney a couple of weeks earlier, these two brothers, and they were back in Dublin. And Collins called for autopsies to be done on Dick and Padder and Connor's boss. Connor was working for an Irish newspaper and that's why he was in Dublin. And uh, he called for an, an autopsy to be done on them. So what the independent autopsy was shown that Padder's legs were crushed. He'd broken ribs, very badly beaten around the face. And I had to write it down, actually. Um, bear with me. So we were able to ascertain that they were lined up against the wall and they were taken out, you know. So Padder had, it was seven bullets with nine wounds. And Dick had 15 bullets. Oh, sorry, two bullets causing three wounds. And Connor had 15 bullets causing nine wounds. But Dick McKee was also uh, bayoneted. And, um, and as I said, multiple broken bones. So the story of what the British Army released saying, Padder jumped up from behind a mattress, you're going, how with the crushed legs? You know, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't fit in, nothing fits. And how we found out about the broken legs was there was um, a commission, an American commission, that investigated all these. There was a stream of Irish men being killed in this particular guard room. And they all just happened to be escaping out of a really small window. And they were going like, how, how was this constantly happening? So they looked into everything. And they were the ones that were able to find out that the three men were up against the wall. Any bruises that were on their face or body, the British Army said it was post-mortem that it happened after they died from where they fell, but they, they slumped against the wall. So all the bruising and that happened to them before 
So um, Collins was devastated at the deaths. He just couldn't take it. Dick and Patter had been together since 1916. And they were in the four courts. And they were apparently, Collins always said they were the only two that thought along his lines. And when they died, he came out hiding. And when they died, he had written on their card, um, a memory of my very, two very good friends, Dick and Patter, two of Ireland's best soldiers. Um, so they, the two were buried together, Patter and Dick, in Glasnevin in the, in the Republican plot. And wow. Connor was brought home to County Clare. And um, there was never any court martialing. There was never, it was just kind of let to the side. And the man who instigated shooting them was uh, someone called Captain Hoppy Hardy. And he was Hoppy Hardy because he'd lost a leg in the war. And so he had an artificial limb and he lived until the 1960s and up until his death, he never regretted what he did to Patter and to Connor and to Dick. You know, from the discussion, uh, it, it's very clear that what happened on that day was, I suppose, a manifestation of uh, the struggle of a small nation against an empire. Um, we have to remember that at that time, the British Empire was a victorious uh, combatant or belligerent from the First World War. They believed, certainly, that their empire would not, not only go on, but actually grow. Uh, they were very assured of their strength and they were um, hugely well resourced and equipped. And against that, um, the Irish people and a, a, a relatively small guerrilla army uh, fought for independence. Um, having you know, having the mandate of the people for for uh, independence, uh, which was refused recognition by the British, which we should never forget, which was the British government's refusal to acknowledge the, the democratic will of the Irish people that led to the tragic conflict. And uh, all uh, war is tragic and all deaths on all sides are, are tragic as they were uh, on that uh, day, Bloody Sunday. So um, I hope you found our discussion uh, enlightening and uh no me dirty shoot uh galer uh akahara eat shoot for boss or son